I make games and to make them I use Unity. And what I like to do is to make them all in a consistent general style so that I can constantly iterate and improve my craft. But one day I realized that I was re-implementing so many features so often and so I sat down and I did one thing and that was to make a list of the features that were pretty general and I could share between projects. That list ended up having five points and I could have had even more, but I didn't want to tunnel myself in too much and make my games all too samey, so I left it at that. So one example of the things that I want to have a consistent thread throughout my games is the cutscenes, because many of my games have cutscenes in this kind of DS era Nintendo style, where characters have expressions, sprite changes, and animations based on position, rotation, and scale. And so what I did was I made a cutscene system that has a bunch of features that all serve in being able to make stuff like this as easily as possible. Like, for example, let me show you this cutscene that I made for my unannounced RPG, and later I'll show you exactly what the back end for it looks like. It's super simple. So this is what the cutscene editor looks like and you can see that the first thing that happens is that the cutscene song is played and then the more zoomed in camera is activated. Then I force the player to walk instead of run. The running is the animation that you see around when you walk in the world. And then I force the player to walk to this waypoint, point which I've named one, it could be anything, it could be called like shop location. <laughs> And then here's the next new thing, which is the dialogue. And so you can see that the player says it physically hurts. And then I can either have the player have the icon or not. And so if it doesn't have an icon, it doesn't appear here in the editor. And it works pretty simple, especially if I want to bring in a designer or somebody who does the narrative into the project and has no programming experience. And then changing the actual sprite itself is as simple as just choosing it here. Then after that, I go and I do a bit of more walking, same as before. Uh, play the question emotion on the player. And then there's a bit of more of animation stuff. And then I stop the music, right? So that's just the command here that you can choose any of. So I can just go nothing. I can go dialogue and it just appears. I'm just going to keep that at stop music. And then here's another instance of changing the camera, which is called just look at Gale because it looks at that character. All sort of stuff. Same with this nudge animation that you see on the side. And so does the heel. And that's about it. So it's all pretty block based. And if I just wanted to add more things, I could. Here I change the quest state of the game. So uh, there's the quest name, which is called the main quest. And I say that the new state is now post chalky. So after getting the chocolate. Uh, so now that could potentially open up new quests for the main quests that progress if you have the chocolate. And so, you know, this works perfectly fine for the RPG. But what's really crazy is that despite originally making this system for the RPG that I just showcased, a while back I made an update for my roguelike, Soulstalker, and that update simply added a campsite area to make the game feel a bit more homey between runs. And as a part of this, I wanted to add NPCs, and usually this would take so long, right? But, you know, because I already made the system for the other game, the implementation took, I'm not kidding, just about an hour, actually probably even less. So here's how this looks like in Soulstalker, and even though it's a very, very different game to the RPG, it works perfectly just as it should. And so another one of these points that ended up in multi-game systems was made for Synth Beast, and it was a day-night system to make environments have even more variety throughout gameplay. And here's how that looks and how it works. So here's Synth Beast and you know, everything with the editor is right here, but the most important thing for this is the day-night controller, right? And so there's a bunch of parameters, but there's two buttons as well that allow me to test this out just without having to rely on the code of the game or like wait around for the day and night stuff to happen. So I'm just going to click on become night and you see exactly how this happens. So pretty seamless. I can make it day again. Just works, right? And so there's a bunch of parameters here, but there's one key thing that's like the biggest difference. Like it's pretty obvious that you should change like the intensity of light and stuff like that. But uh, the post processing is actually what makes most of this effect happen. And so what I actually do is I have a night volume, right? Which controls kind of like the visual effects of the night. So you can, you know, see exactly what kind of post-processing visual color effects that I'm doing here. And then there's the same for the day, right? So just more temperature right here to make the day a bit more colorful. 
Same thing with here for the post exposure. And then I have a base post processing volume, which is just for like the depth of field, the vignette, stuff like that, stuff that doesn't have to be different between the day and the night. And so what happens here for the most part when I click on become day or become night is when you click here on the day, you see this one changes. So the weight of the day volume changes to make it more day. And what actually happens is that the night volume also changes to be zero. So I can just go like this, right? And there's no difference because the, the day has priority. But if I go like that, you can see it just becomes night like that. So I can just like slide it. So this could be like midday or like not quite night, like 6 p.m. or something like that. Uh, and so it works pretty well. And just as you might imagine, I also moved this over to Soulstalker. And again, this only took me like 10 minutes because I already made it for the previous game. But I'm actually a bit unsure of how exactly I'm going to implement this or if I will at all. But it was a nice test to do just to test out how easily moved this system is. So if you have any suggestions, I'd love to hear them in the comments. The net level looks pretty cool, so I want to put it to use, you know? And so now this next point's a bit different, but one thing that you might notice is that all of my games have 2D sprites in a 3D world, and this is because of what I said near the start of the video, where I want to really, really focus on one general style and hone that as much as possible. And usually you'd think that the best way to approach animations for such a system is to make something built in like Unity's animation, and I actually did try that with my first ever 2D prototype on Unity. You can actually see that on screen right now. Uh, but you know, it was just so messy. You end up spending so much time clawing through the menus and dealing with a state system that is meant more for 3D animations and kind of blending stuff. And there's a built-in solution to this, which is just to have the animations float around in the UI and just trigger them in code. But then there's the issue of how you have to space out the animations in the animation timeline. And I can go on and on about how annoying this is, specifically for 2D games, uh, but you get the point, right? So I don't have to go through that. But the thing is, because I came from using GameMaker before using Unity, I knew that there was definitely a much better way to approach this. And so that's how I ended up making my animation system. It's inspired by the one in GameMaker. It's super basic and each animation is just an array of the frames, which you can just drag and drop mega easily. And then there's a parameter that determines how long each frame lasts. Then there's this character animation component that has a list of all of the animations and whether they loop, what animation they should go back to on complete and so on, and that's about it. So to trigger a certain animation, I can just also write some code that is as basic as just what you see on screen right now, and I save myself so many headaches. And ever since I made this system about a year ago, maybe a bit less, there's literally not a single game that I make that doesn't use this, so it was an amazing time investment. The last two points are not as broadly applicable as the first three, and you'll see why. And the first of these is my combat system that I made for my action kind of games. And at first, I just made it for Soul Soccer with no real intention to use it for other games. But then when I started making Synth Beast, it made sense to take what I learned and make something more generalizable. And so I did exactly that, and because of it, I was able to use it as the basis for not only Synth Beasts, but also Wanted Shadows, which released on Steam a few months ago for just $1.49, links in the description. And so the final of the five points is the one that I'm by far the most excited about, but unfortunately I can't show that much about it compared to the other ones, and that is a turn-based RPG combat system that I've been developing together with my big unannounced RPG. And while I can't show it just yet, I really really can't wait to make it all public. And turn-based RPGs like Bravely Default, Octopath Traveler, Pokemon, and Paper Mario are by far my favorite genre to play, so I'm super excited to get back into it, and you'll all get to learn about the game soon enough. The system that I'm making is incredibly versatile. It allows for cool 1v1 battles, 4v4, 3v3, maybe even 5v5, a wide variety of different status effects. So I'm really planning on making this a really solid system to build my future RPGs off of. And if you want to support me and help me in developing my games, the best thing you can do is buying my games in the link below, which you can find on Steam. I have a bundle with the two released ones that you can get for just $5.70. It's just crazy cheap, so get that. And you can also wishlist Synth Beast, which has been making some really, really great progress recently. Also, subscribe, and if you want to learn more about what I feel is the best way to learn game development, watch the video on screen right now. And that's it for this week. I'll see you all for the next devlog, and bye.